I like to go to other churches, and I like to take in adult Sunday school in other churches. Because adult Sunday school is such a weird thing. It's a little bit different everywhere you go. I remember one time I was, I was away from the church, and I was visiting another church, and we went to an adult Sunday school, and the guy that was teaching it was... It was like going to Sunday school with a pro wrestler. Because he was a weightlifter and he was really excited and he would cry and he would scream and he would shout and be like, I'm just going to tell you, God is doing so many awesome things. It's just amazing. And I was sitting there going, wow, this guy is pumped up and excited. And I, I watched a lot of people just kind of watch him and, and God kind of used his personality uh, to kind of draw them in and, Went to another adult Sunday school class once where there was a retired teacher, and he used to be a, uh, a math teacher and a history teacher, and he retired, and I walked into that class, and it amazed me because this was a small town in Montana. The town was 210 people in population, and there were 30 adults in his class that day. In that church, they had over 100 people, half the town. But they had 30 adults in that adult Sunday school class. And I knew I was in for a treat. You can always tell you're in for a treat when there's a lot of people there. Because it means there's probably something good going on. So I got there and there was, there was 30 adults there. And he started teaching. And he began to give historical facts. And he began to give, as he went into the Word, he would open up the Word and read the Scripture. And as he, as he did that, he brought everything to life. And it was amazing. I went to another church that I was visiting, and I went to a Sunday school, and there was just a handful of people there, and most of them were, were older. And an older guy got up and began to teach a lesson, and I was trying to take notes when I'm, when I'm listening. So I was listening to him, and I was taking notes. And uh, a lady that was sitting behind us asked him a question, and the question was kind of unrelated to the lesson, and well, we got, we, we were visiting that church, and we got done, we got in the car, we're driving back home, and I said to Nicole, I said, what was Sunday school about? She said, I don't know. I said, I don't know either. I said, did you, did you look at anybody else in that Sunday school class? She's like, well, there's only a few people to look at. A couple of them were looking out the window. A couple of them were looking at their watches. And I said, well... And, and I thought, at the time, I thought, well, our church has got bad Sunday school. But then, when you find something worse, it makes you feel kind of good about yourself. <laughs> Finding something worse makes you feel kind of good about yourself. That's part of the reason we all like spanking the spiritual monkey. You see, that's what that guy was doing in that Sunday school class. He loved teaching Sunday school. But it was benefiting no one. Nobody was learning. Nobody was growing. Nobody was advancing. And a lot of people just weren't coming. But I bet you if you, if you walked up to that guy in that church and said, would you consider not teaching? He would be offended. Because he gets blessed by it. And what we're talking about today is using God for selfish gain. There's a lot of Christians that do good things and godly things, but it's not in servanthood and it's not out of blessing the body, it's out of blessing themselves. <laughs> and they're doing more harm than they are good in the long run. So number one, the sin of pleasuring yourself when you are in a committed relationship is a sin of selfishness. And it's a work of the flesh. When you become a part of the body of Christ, we talked about our commitment to the body of Christ last week. When you're committed to the body of Christ, your commitment is a commitment to putting the needs of others 
above yourself. But so many people aren't looking for a place where they can serve. So many people are looking for a place where they can be served. And just like 20 years ago, if you would pull into a gas station, a little bell would ring, and a dude would run out with a nice cap on and some coveralls. He'd say, fill her up and take your oil. <laughs> and you'd be like, absolutely, dude. And he'd like do a little thing. So you got to take up the and if you... If you had a charge account there, you could say, charge it to my account, you could drive off, you never even have to get out of the car, it was easy. But you don't see that very often anymore. Now most of the stations are self-service. You have to serve yourself. You have to check your own oil. So most of us just don't bother. If the oil light comes on, time to get a change. <laughs> you, have to, you have to wash your own windows. And you can see through bugs for quite a while before you have to do that. When it's self-service, the service isn't quite as good. But a lot, of, a lot of churches have become that. A lot of Christians have become interested in self-service. <laughs> Self-pleasure. Galatians 5, 19-23 says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, Eagerness for lustful pleasure. An eagerness for lustful pleasure. I need to be happy. Idolatry. Participation in demonic activities. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger. Selfish ambition. Division. The feeling that everyone is wrong <coughs> except those in your own little group. Envy. Drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sins. Let me tell you again as I have before that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But when the Holy Spirit <coughs> controls our lives, He will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, <clears throat> goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, <clears throat> and self-control. Here, there is no conflict with the law. You see, one of the problems that we have today in the church is a lot of people are serving lustful pursuits of selfish ambition. People feel like if they don't have a position, they don't have a place. You know, when we have a missionary come to speak, or when we have an evangelist come to speak, I still come to church. I don't skip because I'm not preaching. It's not a self-service issue. We have to be committed to Christ and committed to the body. But a lot of people are merely committed to themselves and merely committed to their own pleasure. If it makes me happy, if I can do something, if I can do something that makes me happy, I'll be there. But I'll tell you something, buddy. I'm not coming to serve. I'm coming to be served. And one of the reasons that it's hard to do things today in the church, and one of the reasons it's hard to it's hard to create function is because to an extent we've catered to that selfish pleasuring kind of idolatry in people of putting themselves above everything else when it's not right number two the scriptures command us to be interested in the lives and the needs of others the scriptures command us to be interested in the lives and the needs of others. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't think only about your own affairs. But be interested in others too. 
and what they are doing. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody who is intensely selfish? They just didn't care about you at all. And they'll be like, oh, let me tell you about my day, man. Oh, I had the most interesting day. You know, today I was, I was walking down the street and I saw this lady and she's like really weird looking. And I was like, I'm like looking at her. She got all mad at me. She's like, what are you looking at? And I'm like, oh man, you said it all. She was just like, she almost tried to hit me and I ducked it. It was just, it was horrible. And then, then I got to work and my boss was like really mad at me because I was late. And man, he always gets mad at me. But I, I just get, you know, I, 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 the drive sometimes I get in traffic and I can't make the call. And then and blah, 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 blah. So, that's, that's pretty much my day. Hey, do you wonder how my day was? Oh, look at the time. i got to get out of here. i got to go. Glad I could talk to you. He wasn't really talking to you <clears throat> as much as he was talking at you. We need to be interested in the lives of others. And that interest needs to be a genuine interest. See, sometimes as Christians, we feign interest. Because it serves our needs. What? Yeah. We love to be needed. And so sometimes we'll go around and we'll baby people. Or we won't be honest with people. We won't tell them the truth because we love it when they need us. I'm so broken. I'm so upset. I've got so many hurts in my life, and I just don't know what to do. And we sit and we go, oh, sweetie, honey, baby, sugar, are you okay? Oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. The Holy Spirit might be saying to us, tell them to stop sinning. But you know what would happen if we said that to them? They wouldn't want to have anything to do with us. We'd lose our little wind-up toy. Because we love the fact that they meet our emotional needs. And as long as they're emotionally crippled, we're gaining something from it. It's purely selfish. And they're gaining something from us that's purely selfish. Because they go to a sounding board and they never get told that they have to change. <clears throat> and it's a mutual, parasitical relationship that's nothing more than just self-pleasure. It has nothing to do with getting better. A lot of people say, well, you have to be sensitive sometimes. You can't just brutally attack people all the time and tell them the truth. Yes, you do. You have to be sensitive. And you have to convey the truth in a sensitive manner. But there is a time when you have to quit holding people's hands and quit lying to them and be honest with them. Just because it meets your need just because it meets your need, you can't keep lying to somebody else. Because you could be destroying the church. You could be destroying the foundation of what God wants to do. Because if you keep somebody else where they are, you know it keeps you where you are. And that's one of the things that we have to do. We have to be interested in the needs of others. And when we put others before ourselves, sometimes we make some choices that are hurtful. Hurtful to self, but helpful to the church. So number three, when we walk in selfishness, we walk in emotion. And that leads to the demonic. When we walk in selfishness, we walk. If you want to talk yourself out of serving God or out of doing the thing that God wants you to do, you only have to add one thing emotion. Because your emotions are a mess. And human emotions are good. God gave us emotions. We should have emotions. But we cannot be led by emotions, we have to be led by truth. <coughs> we can experience emotions. But if we're led by emotions, we'll be led astray. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. If you are wise and understand God's ways, live a life of steady goodness, so that only good deeds will pour forth. 
and you won't brag about the good you do, then you will be truly wise. But if you're bitterly jealous, and there's selfish ambition in your hearts, don't brag about being wise. That's the worst kind of lie. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and motivated by who? The devil. See, a lot of times we don't realize that some of our spiritual pride, it doesn't come from God. It comes from the enemy. And there's a lot of people that are these big, wonderful bastions of Christianity, and the fact that they're big, wonderful bastions of Christianity is nothing more to them than a merit badge. It's not coming out of a sincere heart. It's, not come, it's, it's coming out of a, man, I want to make myself look good. I want to talk about how spiritual I am. I want you to know how spiritual I am. Look at how spiritual my children are. Praise God, I've got spiritual children. Doesn't that make me a wonderful spiritual person? I am so spiritual. Worship me. I mean, worship God. Don't worship me, but worship God. That selfishness begins to come out. And we don't find intimacy with God in that. But we do take pleasure in it. We do take pleasure in it. Pastor Troy, have you ever spent your spiritual monkey? Yes. Indeed I have. I can tell you times <coughs> when I've done things in the flesh and I've done things not in the spirit over and over again. Sometimes to accommodate myself. Sometimes to accommodate others because I know if I keep these others happy, I'll be happier. Well, I don't want to deal with that person, man. If that person gets ticked off, they'll start a war and they'll start a... You can't live your life by that standard. You have to do what God says and not what man says. And it's tough sometimes not to take the easy road, not to do the easy thing, not to do the thing that would make everybody happy. It's even tougher not to do the thing that would make you happy. One time we had a youth convention and I always, I always prayerfully considered the guests of youth convention and, and I used to talk to them on the phone and sometimes if, if I book a speaker and the speaker, if I get a bad feeling about this speaker just talking to them or if I think that they were just after money, I would cancel them and book somebody else. But there was one year that we had a youth convention that I did something really selfish. We were having a theme called the Outer Limits. That was our, our Speed the Light theme, was taking it to the Outer Limits. And I love all things that are just nutty and weird and spacey. <laughs> and I thought, you know what would be really cool? There's a crazy guy that lives down in Denver that goes and speaks at these like UFO conferences and does like... And, and I said to Nicole, I said, I should have Norm speak for a night of this. She said, I don't know, I wouldn't do that. See, I should, should always listen to Nicole. <laughs> but I don't. <coughs> I, said, I said, I should have Norm come and speak. She said, I don't know. I don't know if you know, you're into that, but I don't think everybody else is into that. That just might not be... I said, well, it's, it goes along with our theme. It's perfect. You see, when we, when we want to do something selfish, we can always find a way to rationalize it or a way that it's a God thing. That's why, that's why you know, people that over-spiritualize things drive me nuts because anything can become a God thing through justification and emotion. You understand what I'm saying? You can take anything and rationalize that it's a God thing. Well, we're having a space theme, honey. And, and this guy talks about space people. <laughs> and he's spacey, so it's got to work together. Oh, it was awful. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. When Norm came in and set up for that Friday night presentation, and he was sitting on the stage there at Casper, and he said, I just got to tell you something, brother. And I said, what? He said, I admire you. 
you got a lot of guts bringing a guy like me into something like this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, crud. <laughs> what did I do? He gets up and starts his presentation. And he starts going through stuff. And about halfway through, he's getting into some really weird stuff. And it's not, it wasn't heretical and it wasn't unbiblical. It was just something that most Christians aren't usually exposed to. And he was using clips and he was using... All of a sudden, boom, one of our biggest youth groups in the state, they stand up and they walk out. And all of a sudden, there's this big, like, empty group of seats. And I'm sitting there going, okay, maybe they had to be somewhere. Uh, maybe they, they had to. About the time I was thinking that, boom, this youth group, about 10, 12 people from the other side, they get up. And they walk out. And uh, we lost three different youth groups that night from the conference. I got up about a couple minutes after that last youth group walked out. I got up and I said, we're done. He said, oh, well, I've still got some rides. We're done. So I took the mic and prayed and we dismissed everybody. I had, I had a couple kids, actually a couple kids from Gillette, walked up to me and hugged me. And they said, man, this was awesome. This was so cool. Thank you so much for doing this. But you know, even though they appreciated that, I can't take that and go, oh, it was right. Matter of fact, that night, one of the kids from the youth group that walked out, he was so freaked out because of the presentation, he couldn't sleep. <laughs> so his youth leader had to go in and talk to him. Led him to the Lord. Gave his heart to Christ. Wow, that's wonderful. That's, that's definitely a sign, right? No. You've got to remember this. When Jonah was fleeing from Nineveh, everybody on his boat got saved once they threw him overboard and the fish ate him. That doesn't mean he was supposed to be there. It just means that the Word of God doesn't return void. As Christians, we need to remember that. Because sometimes we use this, oh, this happened and that happened, so it has to have been a God thing, right? No. Even in our rebellion and even in our selfishness, the Word of God does not return void. Went out to the restaurant with the speaker afterwards. And one of the things you got to remember, this is just kind of a funny story, but one of the things you got to remember, our speaker lost his hand when he was a kid. And so he just had a stump. He had a hand and a stump. And uh, he wasn't shy about it. You know how a lot of people have a disability or something, they're kind of, like, he was just, he'd wave it all over the place. And even when he got worked up in speaking, his little stump would be flying up through the air. <laughs> the other speaker I had was, well, he's been to this church several times, Noel Rosa. He's got OCD really bad. We were... Hubert's and, and uh, Costello's and, and myself, we were at this restaurant one day and we were going to pray and we all reached out to hold hands and he was like, uh, I just washed my hands, sorry guys. Um, he couldn't hold our hands because his hands were clean. He has a phobia about people with disabilities. And that night, we were all sitting and eating. We took Norm out and we took him out. And Norm walks up to Noel, put his stump on Noel's shoulder, <laughs> and said, Hey, brother, how are you doing tonight? And Noel got this like blue face and this like look like, uh, I'm okay. And as soon as Norm walked away, Noel ran out of his chair into the bathroom. And we didn't see him for another 30 minutes. Because he got messed up. Then I said to Norm, I said, well, it was, I said, it was probably not a good idea bringing you in tonight. He looked at me and said, oh, it's like plowing cement, brother. I was like, okay. Yeah. 
wow, it's mint, yeah. <laughs> well, tomorrow my district's going to bury me in mint. So <laughs> if you got your plow, bring it with you. And so the next morning, I had to get up at the convention. It was Saturday morning. Two of the youth groups came back. One of the youth group, and they, they never came back. They, they woke up that morning and left. And uh, when I spanked the spiritual monkey that time, it cost me $1,000. Because I had to refund all their money. I didn't have to, but I did. Because they were disappointed in the convention. I had to get up and apologize to a whole bunch of people. But see, I think the hardest thing it is, the hardest thing for us to realize is, sometimes there's things that we intensely love and we may even have a passion for them. But we're not supposed to be doing them. And it may be the desire of our heart. I mean, this, this was an area I had an interest in and I had a love for. But it wasn't my place. I did something selfish and I did something stupid. <coughs> and maybe ruined an opportunity for some young kid <coughs> who could have gotten touched that weekend by the Holy Spirit. And instead got turned off. Somebody's eternity. I could have cost somebody their eternity. And one of the things that we don't realize is that when we serve God, when we come to church, when we worship, we're not playing games. It's not a social club. It's not a fun time group. It's not a, hey, hey, let's have a speak all. Let's have a hoedown. Let's have a... It's not that. It is very serious business because every time that somebody comes up on this platform, a life could be affected for eternity. And it's not worth my own pleasure to let one soul escape from knowing a living God, from altering their lives. So number four, how can I stop blessing myself and start blessing others? How can I stop blessing myself and start blessing others? You know, when we start, when we start getting into that self, that spirit of blessing ourselves, that spirit of making ourselves happy spiritually all the time, here's what's going to happen. After a while, we're going to begin to hate who we're ministering to. And I'm going to tell you why. You're going to begin to hate the congregation and hate the people and hate the crowd because... If you continue on in a selfish vein, they're not going to vibe with you anymore. You're not going to get the response that you want to see. And pretty soon you're going to say, this is a dead church. We need to move the Holy Spirit. These people just ain't with it. And the truth is, that's not the truth. They are with it. They're just not with you. They're not vibing with you. I remember a, a time not too long ago, we had some friends. They were worship leaders in a small town church. Most of the people in that church, can I get a little more bass there? Most of the people in that church were in their 70s. They were mostly retired congregation. And my friends, they were wonderful people. I love them. To this day, I still love them. But they were trying to rock out that church. The thing is, you don't rock out a bunch of 70-year-olds. <laughs> and they got mad. They got frustrated. <coughs> so the pastor said, well, why don't you just sing a couple hymns? They were all, we don't do hymns. I hate those hymns. I hate those <laughs> If I can't spank my monkey up on that stage for everyone to see, I'm not going to step up there. So that's what it was about. And they began to despise the people they were ministering to, and they quit. They left. And they never had a heart for the people. They never had a heart for the people. They never had any love for the people. And you can have it just the opposite way, too. I'm not up here defending hymns. I'm saying you can have a young congregation 
You have a bunch of people that all they want to do is sing from the hymnal. I'm not going to sing that rocky stuff. Praise God. When we realize it's not about us, it's not about our personal preference, it's about reaching people for the kingdom, and we can lay down these things and sometimes lay down ourselves, that'll change things. So how do we do this? Well, A, we need to walk in humility before God and put others above ourselves. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, You younger men, accept the authority of the elders, and all of you serve each other in humility, for God sets himself against the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Do you want the favor of God in your life? Do you want real spiritual blessing? Make yourself of no reputation. Humble yourself. Be a servant. B. We must learn to love and to cherish God's word. You want to get over selfishness and spirituality? You have to get into God's Word. Because God's Word will steer you towards truth. A lot of people are light on God's Word, heavy on emotion. Oh, this is what I feel. This is what I feel. Follow your feelings and see where they lead you. Give me a call when you need some help out. Because feelings will always lead you into a bad place. God's truth will lead you into righteousness. Psalms 119, 7 through 9. When I learn your righteous laws, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your principles. Please don't give up on me. How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word and following its rules. The word of God is powerful and it can change us. It can change our hearts. It can cause us to be humble. It can, it can pierce right through all of the things inside of us that would cause us to not serve God. See, we have to have the fear of God in our lives. You know, one of the reasons that the church today, and I'm not talking about our church, I'm talking about the church across America, is so full of a selfish, self-induced and enticing spirituality is because the fear of God is lacking. We're not worried about the fact that what we're doing has ripples through eternity. We're not worried about the fact that what we're doing, we are doing before an almighty God, that someday we will be judged for everything that we do. We're not thinking about that. We're not thinking, you know, my friends that led worship in this church, all they were thinking about is these people aren't with it. But someday I think God might ask them, did you love those people? Because if you really loved them, you could have laid down your own preference and made them happy. And from that joy, I'd have blessed you with growth. You see, a lot of times what we do is we kill the Spirit, quench the Spirit by that selfishness. And we need the fear of God to be so afraid of Him, so in awe of Him, that we're not going to do something out of step. Psalms 34, 11 through 14. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. You know, not all of us know how to fear the Lord. But if we ask Him, He will teach us how to fear Him. Do any of you want to live a life that is long and good? Then watch your tongue and keep your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Work hard at living in peace with others. When the fear of God overcomes us and overtakes us, all of a sudden, we're not so worried about what so-and-so thinks or what this person thinks. We're worried about what God thinks. And we'll humble ourselves. And that humility will bring forth a peace, a deem, a final point. We have to make the cross of Christ the center of our lives. We have to make the cross of Christ the center of our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1-5. through 5. Dear brothers and sisters, when I first came to you, I didn't use lofty words and brilliant ideas to tell you God's message. For I decided to concentrate only on Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. And my message and my preaching were very plain. I did not use wise and persuasive speeches. But the Holy Spirit was powerful among you. I did this so that you might trust in the power of God rather than in human wisdom. When we make the cross, 
and Christ's death on the cross, the center of our lives, we realize that true power doesn't come from our own strength. It comes from our weakness and His strength. It comes from when we're humbled and, and we're willing to say, you know what, maybe this isn't my time. Maybe this isn't my place. Maybe this isn't what I am supposed to be doing. And God, I will lay this down for you. Sometimes we need to say that. Sometimes we need to say, God, I will lay down my own self-interest for you. Because it's really not spiritual if we don't do that. If you decide that you're committed to a body, well, you look at something and go, well, I don't know if I want to hear that message, so I won't come this week, but I'll come this week. You're not committed to the body. You're committed to self-interest. If you decide that you like one thing better than another, or you like, you know, well, there's, there's, there's this study over here and that study over there, but I like this person better than that person, so I'm not going to go to any of this, but I'll come if this. You're not committed to the body. You're committed to self-interest. And God can do amazing things in spite of you. But you should see what he could do if you'd actually go to him. You see what he could do if you would decide that your intimacy is going to be between him and you and you're going to be a servant to his people. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. <clears throat> every head bowed and every eye closed, I have a question for you and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. This is between you and God. This is a hard thing. <clears throat> I want you to ask yourself this question. Who are you really serving? Who are you really serving? Are you serving God or are you serving yourself? Are you looking for ways that you can be a servant to God? Or are you looking for ways that God can be a servant to you? Are you really a part of the body and working in the body to see the fullness of the kingdom being lived through your life? Or are you just warming a pew, sitting in a chair every week, liking it when it's good and hating it when it's bad? God wants more. <coughs> he wants everything that you have. And I want to challenge you right now, if you're hard, isn't in the right place, or if it's been self-seeking, I want to challenge you just to ask God to soften your heart. Say, Lord, I'll humble myself, and I'll give you the reins. Lord, if there's something you need me to lay down, I will lay it down, God, and I will take up my cross, because, God, my ambition is to serve you and to let this world see the light of your Father God, right now in Jesus' name, I just come before you, Lord.